Now, you may be wondering why I would spend so much of my very limited time in this presentation sharing with you a demonstration of story listening. Story listening developed by Dr. Benico Mason, which is one form of comprehensible input developed by Dr. Stephen Krashen. Hopefully, in watching that demonstration, you learned or acquired new signs in American Sign Language that you did not know previously, and you saw how effective this way of teaching can be. Hello, my name is Frederick Stamps. I teach American Sign Language at Pacific University and Edison High School in Oregon, and like many of you, I've also been teaching my own kids at home during quarantine. And I want to share with you more about comprehensible input, story listening, and how we can use these to teach this fall. First, let's look at what comprehensible input is. I spent a decade of my career sucking the interest out of my students and getting burnt out by using traditional methods. What Dr. Krashen discovered was that we do not become fluent in a language by studying grammar rules in isolation, but we become fluent in a language by understanding what is being said. So comprehensible input is simply language at a level that the learner can understand. And Dr. Krashen makes this distinction between learning about a language and acquiring a language. When we as young children all learn our first language, we are not concerned about grammar rules, but about communicating. However, unfortunately, all too often language classes focus on grammar rules, learning about a language, but not helping students understand the language. You can memorize grammar rules and vocabulary, but that doesn't mean that you can understand them in a conversation. This knowledge of a language does not translate to understanding. This point is well illustrated by engineer Destin Sandlin, who explains in one of his YouTube videos about how a welder friend of his modified a bicycle to reverse its steering so that the bike's front wheel turned the opposite direction of its handlebars. Sandlin thought that with the knowledge of how the bike's steering worked, he would be able to quickly learn to ride it, only to find, quote, In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding." Close quote. And Dr. Krashen argues that we learn languages, or acquire them rather, implicitly through exposure to comprehensible input, rather than explicitly studying grammar rules. Similarly, Mike Pito says our students should be focused on what is being said, not how we are saying it. Rather than explain comprehensible input further, let me show you a demonstration. Dr. Krashen actually gives a better demonstration of comprehensible input in a video on YouTube, but I thought for this presentation I would take a stab at demonstrating it myself. I will give you three example lessons in my second language. Lesson number one. Watakushi no dobutsu wa iroiro na iro ga arimasu. Watakushi no inu wa shiro desu. Ooki desu. Watakushi no neko wa kuro to shiro desu. Neko wa chisai desu ne. Soshite mo ippiki neko ga imasu. Ano, soto no neko, nojo no neko. Sore wa kuro to shiro to chairo desu. For those of you who don't already speak Japanese, how was that short lesson? As Krashen asks, do you think if I kept talking to you like that, that you would pick up Japanese? Not very likely. Now, lesson number one was an immersion-based lesson. Now, lesson number two, this is a grammar-based lesson. So, in Japanese, when you want to say you want to do something, you have the verb in base two plus tie. So, for example, you say you want to eat. Tabe tai, because this is an ichidan, so it just has the stem of it, and then you add tai on it. I want to eat. Or you want to talk. Hanasu in dictionary form of base three. Yeah. 
you change it to um, base two, uh, base two, Hanashi, Hanashtai. I want to talk. Pretend for a moment you understand what I am talking about with verb bases, stems, and ichidons in Japanese. Unlike the immersion-based lesson, this grammar-focused lesson explains explicitly a grammar rule. There are several problems with this lesson. Learning this grammar in isolation doesn't enable students to understand it when they hear it in conversation. In fact, focusing on grammar like this can cause students to become overly conscientious about making grammatical errors in the target language and can contribute to them associating the language with anxiety. Moreover, except for the tiny minority of people who love studying grammar and who wind up becoming language teachers, this grammar-focused lesson is boring. Most people who want to learn to speak a new language aren't taking a class because they love grammar. Thus, as Krashen points out, this type of grammar lesson is soon forgotten. It fails to deliver a message that students would intrinsically care about. Now, let's look at how many new words in Japanese you can pick up with comprehensible input. Watashi no inu. Inu wa shiroi desu. Shiroi. Inu wa shiroi desu. Watashi no neko. Watashi no neko wa shiro. Shiro to kuro. Shiro to kuro desu. Soto ni iru neko mo imas. Kore wa nojo no neko. Kore wa kono neko. Neko wa kuro to chairo to shiro desu. Shiro desu. Kono neko wa mitsu no iro desu ne. Kono neko, neko wa kuro. So, shiro, 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 to chairo desu. Kuro, shiro, chairo desu. Hopefully, the input I provide in this last very brief example lesson is sufficiently clear for you to acquire a little Japanese. As Krashen puts it, quote, If you understood that lesson, not every word, but more or less, I did everything necessary to teach you German, or in this case, Japanese. And now I'm going to share with you the most important thing I have learned about language. Probably the best kept secret in the profession. We acquire language in one way, and only one way, when we understand messages. We call this comprehensible input. Close quote. So Krashen argues that the one thing that makes everything else easier or unnecessary is comprehensible input. I would like to expound on this quote from him. The best methods are therefore those that supply comprehensible input in low anxiety situations containing messages that students really want to hear. Krashen actually points out three keys to successful language instruction in this quote. We have already looked at how comprehensible input means the learner can understand what is being said in the target language. In addition to this, we want our classrooms to provide low anxiety situations for learning. Krashen argues for this in his affective filter hypothesis in which he posits that forcing students to start producing speech in the target language prematurely is counterproductive to language learning. This is because when we are stressed, our prefrontal cortex, which is the higher reasoning center of our brain, shuts down and we instead start thinking with our amygdala and go into fight or flight mode. Our hippocampus responsible for helping us learn by encoding long-term memories also shuts down and we instead of learning language, we begin to associate the target language with anxiety. Basically, the way we teach languages in school is wrong. When my birth son was born, I didn't say to him, okay, baby, repeat after me, father. 
Father, come on, what's wrong with you, baby? We allow our children a few years of what Krashen calls the silent period or pre-production period before we expect them to start speaking sentences. But in school, we tell students, welcome to Chinese class, please repeat after me, ni hao ma, or welcome to Estonian class, please repeat after me, guides gazi gabe, or welcome to Hausa class, please repeat after me, iniquana. In the comprehensible input classroom, we avoid forcing output as much as possible. It will come spontaneously. I have seen it in my own students and in my own children. But Krashen warns you need a flood of input to get a trickle of output. And this is because the human brain is much better at recognition of familiar information than recall or retrieval. Lastly of these three points, our language instruction will only be effective as long as we hold our students' interest. We want as much of our instruction as possible to not just be interesting or even engaging, but so fascinating to students that they find it compelling. We're not going to be able to do that 100% of the time. In my experience, it is when we have uninteresting or boring instruction that we see an increased likelihood for undesired behavior from students. This is where story listening and other student-focused strategies come in. When our curriculum is student-centered and we work toward developing genuine positive relationships with our students, when they see how much we care, that's when we can teach them. Story listening is far more than just telling a story in the target language to your students. Ben Slavic puts it well when he says, teach to your students' eyes. I don't have to wait until a formal assessment, a quiz, or an exam to know whether or not my students are understanding what I am telling them in the target language. If I look at my students while I am telling them a story, and their facial expression looks like this, I know they are not understanding me, and I need to slow down and circle back over some of the points in the story. So, Comparing traditional language instruction to what Dr. Krashen calls a natural approach, not the natural approach, as he pointed out to me in a conversation in 2018. Traditional instruction focuses on skill building. We actually have a phrase, drill and kill, meaning repeat a grammatical structure until your students hate you. Whereas Dr. Krashen argues we should focus on exposing our students to a flood of comprehensible input. Traditional instruction emphasizes grammar rules learned in isolation and then forgotten, whereas Krashen supports a non-targeted pop-up grammar approach, as he calls it, where the teacher can point out, even in the student's first language, grammatical features as the class encounters them naturally during story listening or other such activities. For example, if we were studying ancient Egyptian and we came across a passage that referred to Upper and Lower Egypt as the two lands, I could pause for a moment and in English mention to the class pop-up grammar. Notice how when you have a pair of something in ancient Egyptian, instead of using the regular plural form of Ooh, at the end of the word, we had we. So instead of saying the lands as Tau, here with the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt, we say Tawi. While I believe Mike Pito is correct in saying that there is a place for both targeted and non-targeted instruction in the comprehensible input classroom, I have seen great success with pop-up grammar in my classes. And in traditional language instruction, Krashen points out that there is an implied promise, you'll get there someday, which is never. Whereas in the comprehensible input classroom, we say, enjoy the ride. Let's have fun in class playing games and listening to stories and cherish the precious time we have together. Instead of drills in the comprehensible input classroom, we have activities such as TPRS, teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling, story listening, story asking, one word images, and other games. The keys are to keep it comprehensible, keep it low anxiety, and keep it as engaging as possible through keeping your instruction focused on your students. Now, let's look more deeply at the demonstration of story listening from the beginning of this video. As I mentioned, Dr. Benico Mason of Shiten Noji University developed story listening. In story listening, the teacher tells the story. The students are not required to produce output by retelling the story in the target language. However, story listening is more than just the teacher telling a story to the class. There are a few key techniques involved that I would like to point out, and I would also encourage teachers to talk to Dr. Mason to learn more about story listening. Perhaps the most obvious thing is that I draw the story as I tell it, both to keep the story comprehensible and interesting. 
Dr. Mason strongly encourages this and argues you don't have to be an artist. While I feel I should draw more and write less, I write out certain words to ensure comprehensibility. Teaching ASL, I write words in English, but if I were teaching a language with a written form, I would write the words in the target language as much as possible, especially cognates. You'll notice that I repeat many of the words I used in the story. I learned this technique from Tina Hargaden of circling back to the words to allow for repetition, although Hargaden does a much better job of it than I do. The circling should be light circling, not heavy circling to the point that the students become sick of it. Also notice that I try to be careful to tell the story slowly. This is to keep it comprehensible. Speaking of pacing, Ben Slavic told me that when you're speaking, or in this case signing, slowly enough to be painful to you, you're probably going just slowly enough to where it's not too fast for your students to understand. Remember, your students are developing new neural pathways in their brains as they assimilate this new language. Thus, they will require additional processing time to comprehend what the teacher is telling them in the target language. Also concerning pacing, Lynn Ingram taught me the technique of point and pause, where after writing a word on the board while telling a story, I point and I pause before repeating the word in the target language. Again, this is to allow your students additional processing time as they develop new neural pathways. Lastly, I would remind you of Ben Slavik's advice for informal assessment. Teach to your students' eyes. Constantly check to see if your students have facial expressions that indicate understanding, confusion, or even lack of engagement. Adjust what you are doing accordingly. In addition to Dr. Mason's many years of empirical research into the effectiveness and efficiency of Dr. Krashen's natural approach to language acquisition that shows comprehensible input and empowers students to attain proficiency more quickly with less study time than traditional methods, anecdotally I have seen both the proficiency and the engagement of my students substantially improve since I switched from using traditional rote methods of instruction to comprehensible input. Along with story listening, another highly student-centered activity that I learned from Mike Pito and Tina Hargaden is the one-word image, which was developed by Ben Slavic, and which I believe is a form of story asking. However, there is insufficient time in this presentation to demonstrate that activity or other activities adequately. Instead, let's talk about the proverbial elephant in the virtual Zoom room, which is our new reality during the coronavirus pandemic. While we all look forward to the day when this pandemic will be a memory we can tell future students about, I unfortunately think it is likely that this coming fall semester will bring more online teaching for many of us. Some of us will wind up teaching in person with protections to ensure social distancing. Others of us may teach hybrid classes or spend part or even all of the next school year teaching online. The key will be flexibility on our part. We will need to be ready to transition back and forth between in-person and online instruction as seamlessly as possible. I am by no means any more of an expert on distance learning than any of you, my colleagues, who have just experienced much of the same spring term as I have. I can only share what has and has not worked well for me. I tried both Zoom and Google Meets and found Zoom to have more of the functionality I wanted and to be easier to use, although I understand the Google Meets team has been working on improving their product. As a teacher, I found screen sharing and the gallery view in Zoom to be useful. However, I have not found the digital whiteboard on Zoom to be very user-friendly and have instead opted to use a physical whiteboard. When using a whiteboard from my home, I have found that propping it up on an easel or chair to be less effective as I need to hold it with one hand to write on it, whereas the whiteboards I have affixed to walls are much easier to use. You can find inexpensive whiteboards at many different stores. I bought several at Lowe's. While the ability to share my screen with students on Zoom was useful, I found that trying to watch YouTube videos with my students on Zoom was too laggy. Although having students mute their video and audio at times would help with bandwidth, I still found it more practical to have students watch YouTube videos outside of Zoom meetings on their own time and to provide live input in the target language myself during a Zoom meeting. One aspect of remote learning I feel we should take more advantage of is allowing for more asynchronous learning. While I feel there is a place for required synchronous class meetings, 
I feel we should allow our students as much flexibility as possible to learn on their own time by providing pre-recorded videos on YouTube. In way of communicating with students, I found that students at both the high school and college levels were less likely to read emails longer than a couple lines. I recommend keeping emails to students as short as possible. If you have a lot of important information to relay to students, send them a link to a video of yourself verbally going over these announcements. I would also recommend that you be cognizant of how many emails you send to parents and students, as many of us have been inundated with emails during quarantine. Being a parent myself, I have received way too many emails from my children's schools with duplicate information. One teacher sent me eight emails in one day. In tandem with using pre-recorded videos in the target language, one resource you may wish to explore is Edpuzzle. This resource allows you to insert interactive questions in the middle of a video. It pauses the video for the student to answer the question before continuing the video. And in case you've been wondering, I made this video using the academic version of the video editing software Movavi, which I downloaded for half price of the regular software version. And by the way, I'm not getting paid to plug any of these products. Let me close with a document from an anonymous colleague of mine at Pacific University about guiding principles for our curriculum during these surreal and unprecedented times. I would like to emphasize the third point of this document. We cannot just do the same thing online. Some assignments are no longer possible. Some expectations are no longer reasonable. Some objectives are no longer valuable. Again, flexibility will be key to successful teaching this coming school year. Mm -hmm.